Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, thank you for joining us this Christmas morning. As short of being there in glory with the Lord someday, there is truly uh, nowhere I would rather be today than with the family of God that the Lord has uh, called me to treasure uh, and be a part of. Now, here we are, right? <laughs> Suddenly Christmas is right here. And, and now all of the busyness and the preparations have brought us to some place right? Maybe for some of you, a place of exhaustion. For others, a place of expectation, great anticipation, particularly uh, for our little ones. And, and for others, a place of loss and lowliness. We have all, uh, no doubt, <clears throat> traversed, excuse me, a, a number of paths, a number of roads to get here. We are in very different seasons in Life, But what the birth of Jesus that we are here to celebrate, what, what this child king has come to bring to all of our worlds is he has come to chart a new course for our wonder and our joy. Where and if we do not know that or has somehow, uh, have somehow lost sight of that, it is because we have forgotten who it is that was sovereignly set in that manger 2,022 years ago, give or take a year or two for some of you sticklers there. And so what I, what I am setting out to do this morning is, is really very simple. I want to serve you by way of reminder today just who it was uh, in that manger that Christmas night that we might sort of reboot together your capacity for wonder and joy this Christmas. There is, for anyone that names the name of Christ, there, there is a fearlessness and there is a great joy that are available to those who understand just who and what lie in that manger. Now, there are always some Christians who want to push back against a lot of the the secular handling of Christmas, the, the consumerism of it all, the, the drift towards complexity and chaos, the buying, baking, parties, presents. And man, I get it. I really do. But as I tell you, every year we are all in in the Kohler house. Now, it's been a weird December for us to be sure, but uh, the search for my mom's butter cookies finally and did the search for that recipe. That's a good thing. That was like finding the Holy Grail. Uh, she left us to be with the Lord a couple years ago, and, and we've tried to replicate that, could never do it. Now we can. And so it was great to find that. We, we love Christmas at our house. We love everything uh, about it because it is all for us, despite our imperfect celebration. It is for us a celebration of Christ. And when that's your center... Man, you can just let everything else be a good gift that comes down from the Father of lights. James 1.17, right? Don't you find it interesting that the rampant secular commercialism of the holiday, what do you have happening all over the globe at this time of year 
but millions and trillions of lights twinkling in the darkness. Is there not a kind of beautiful, odd, sovereign irony to all of that? Like, like, like it or not world, the world is lit up like a Christmas tree while the children of God are celebrating the light of the world. And so I see all of this as a picture of what we saw in that opening video. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it, John 1.5. Your Christmas tree is not rooted in paganism. You understand that? Okay, don't let anybody tell you that. Jeremiah 10, Isaiah 44, that's, about, that's talking about idolatry. 16th century Protestant Germany is where we get the idea of your tree. And so, I, man, I just want to keep it simple for us. What is in your heart when you celebrate Christmas? And that will tell you where your treasure is, okay? Luke 12, 34. Can you get caught up in the consumerism of it all? Of course you can. Can you make an idol out of stuff? Of course you can. It is the drift towards complexity? Yes, it is. And so I, what I want to do, again, is simple. I want to reboot and remind and reorient all that is swirling around us. Uh, I want to center us this Christmas in the fearlessness and in the great joy that are available to you and I because of that baby in the manger. Let us exalt Christ. Does that sound good to you? Amen. All right. So the way that I want to do that comes through the Christmas text that Danny had read for us out of Luke chapter 2. Why did we read that? Well, because it's important for the church to publicly read the scripture, right? That's our biblical mandate, 1 Timothy 4.13. But there's something almost beyond magical about reading that text at Christmas. And in fact, before we exchange gifts at the Kohler house, we always read Luke chapter 2. We, we are making memories around the Word of God, okay? And so here's my plan for our time together today. I, I want to zero in on two verses in particular uh, out of that Luke text here uh, and use that text to kind of drive us and kind of guide us as a portal to the centerpiece of all Christmas prophecies in the Old Testament, that would be Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. You should be very excited about where God wants to take us this morning. Fearlessness and great joy. Let's get to our portal text in Luke chapter 2. Here it is. These are the two verses I have chosen to, to really tease out of this Christmas passage. And the angel said to them, of course, right before this, uh, the, the angels just lit up the sky there uh, where the shepherds were out tending uh, to their sheep. And the angel said to them, fear not, right? Most oft repeated command in the Bible there. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now, being 57 years old and growing up in the 70s, I can still hear the voice of Linus reading this text in a Charlie Brown Christmas, right? They certainly don't make cartoons the way they used to. But this, <coughs> excuse me, this text right here, in my view, is about as dialed into uh, the reality of Christmas as any two verses in the Bible. Now, let's tease out of this, this text our, our premise and our portal, if you will, to the centerpiece of Christmas prophecy in the Old Testament. First of all, uh, the foundation. Notice here the clear assertion, Christ the Lord. Christ is Lord, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ, who is Christ? The Lord, right? Greek kurios, you've seen that. Supreme in authority, God, Master, Lord. 33 years later in John chapter 20, Thomas will reach in and put his finger into the wounded side of the resurrected Christ, and he will say, my Lord and my God. What makes fearlessness and great joy possible 
in Christmas and in 2023 and beyond is not just that this baby boy will be Savior, not just that he is the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah, but that he is the living Lord God of the universe, supreme in authority, sovereignly ruling the affairs of not just the shepherds, right, but for all people, all people. Who would one day, of course, name the name of Christ. Now, so, okay, pastor, where are you getting this fear not uh, great joy business from? Thought you would never ask right here in our text. Now, notice the angel is telling us, again, not just the shepherds, all of us, right? Notice there are, the angel is telling us two things in this text, right? Fear not, do not be afraid, of course, for I bring you good news of what? Great joy. Those are the two things the angel is telling us in this text. So, so Dr. Luke is telling us in this text that the foundation of Christian fearlessness and Christian joy is rooted in the birth of the Savior on that Christmas night. All right? So that's the foundation. Of that. That's the premise, the, the lordship of this baby in the manger. Now then, follow me. With that is our premise our proposition, let us form out of this a question, okay? How? How does the lordship of this baby boy make possible Christian fearlessness and Christian joy? How? How does the lordship of this baby boy make possible Christian fearlessness and Christian joy? And that is is where I plan to spend the lion's share of our time this morning. We're going to answer that, all right? We're going to make our way back through the tunnel of time, several hundred years, to the premier Christmas prophecy that the Lord put in the pen of the prophet Isaiah. Uh, the Christmas story doesn't begin in Luke 2, right? Understand that? Uh, neither does it begin in, in Matthew chapter 2. But rather, the Christmas story in the Bible begins some 700 years before this night here in Bethlehem uh, in the Gospels. M many of you are familiar with this text. You should be, okay? Uh, this is the most familiar of all the Old Testament prophecies about the birth of Christ. And it is here that we are reminded of the source of Christian fearlessness and Christian joy. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now the chances are excellent that you've already sang this text or heard it several times already this Christmas season as Handel uh, included this text as one of the great choruses in his Messiah oratorio. Uh, this text that we're going to look at here has all in one verse now some of the richest and most profound truths concerning the attributes given to this extraordinary child, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. Now, uh, before we get into these uh, prophetic attributes fulfilled in the life of Christ. Uh, I want us to marvel and wonder uh, over what we're going to see in a little bit, just a sweeping panoramic span of time built into, smuggled into, uh, underneath this text, itself giving us additional uh, attributes of this child. This is going to be very cool. Now, let's set this up. There are seven elements to this text, giving us what, Bible students? A complete picture of who it is that is lying in that manger. Pretty cool, right? Bible students understand that the number seven speaks to completion, right? You've got seven days, seven seas, seven notes in the musical scale. In the Bible, the seven days of creation, the seven letters to the 
seven letters to the seven churches there in Revelation. Uh, We could just keep going. How many I am statements do you have in the Gospel of John? Seven. How many days in a row did the Israelites march around Jericho before the walls fell? Seven. We could keep going, right? The 70 weeks of Daniel, or maybe closer to home where we've been here recently on Sunday mornings. How many times did Jesus tell Peter to forgive his brothers? Seventy times. Seven. Forgive Peter completely, all right? Seven speaks to completion. So I am fascinated uh, by the construction of this text. We serve a God of impeccable order, uh, fascinated here with this construction, giving us a complete picture of our baby in the manger. So let's go get it. Now, number one, Isaiah tells us that a child is Born. Now, this speaks to the humanity of the baby in the manger. It speaks to the humanity of Christ. You should be fascinated by this man. He began life like any other human, an infant. Have you ever paused, paused to marvel over the condescension of this holy God in the incarnation? Imagine what it would be like for you and I to become a slug or a maggot or a gnat, and you still wouldn't have a sliver of the declension our holy God endured to become one of the likes of us. Would you marvel this Christmas day over the humility of God, that he would wrap himself in dependent human flesh, that the God of the universe would subject himself to soiling diapers and spitting up and burping and drooling as any other infant would. The living God has subjected himself to this, right? I mean, for unto us this day is born in that manger. Who? Christ the Lord. Curio, supreme in authority. God, master, Lord did that. Marvel over just that and you would do well this Christmas. Why did he do that? Well, in one sense, so he could be our great high priest and identify with everything we've ever been through, but primarily that he could grow up and take upon himself our sin and go to the cross as a man so you and I wouldn't have to. Listen, God is holy. God is perfectly just. Man is sinful to the core, and so a just God has a problem. What does he do? He wraps himself in human flesh and becomes one of us, substitutes himself for us so sin could righteously be judged in human flesh. Man, don't ever tire of this gospel business, man. Like you got to preach this to yourself every day or grace will be far from you. He takes your sin and gives you his perfect righteousness. And if you're an unbeliever that's wandered in here today with family this Christmas, man, man, does that sound good to you? Come back every Sunday and let me, let me show you just how deep the rabbit hole goes. You will never regret it. The fearlessness and the greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because the Holy One became a son of man so you and I could become sons and daughters of God. Rejoice. Number two, Isaiah tells us, unto us a son is, notice, given. Now this speaks to the Savior's pre-existent deity by saying given here and not born. The prophet is telling us that Jesus existed before his birth. He was already God, right? He was already the second person of the triune Godhead for all of eternity past. You remember all the way back in Genesis chapter 1 uh, that God said among the triune Godhead, uh, Genesis 1.27, I believe, let us make man in what? Our image, right? Our Father, Son, and Spirit, all co-eternal and perfect Trinitarian unity for all time. Well, okay, what does that mean to us? It means Jesus willingly signed up for this, okay? Philippians chapter 2, you know the text, speaking specifically of Christ. Paul says, who, Jesus, 
Man, this is a great Christmas text in in and of itself. Being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. What, what happened on that cross? Remember with me this Christmas. What happened on that cross? The very reason he was born in that manger, to come and conquer sin and death. Right? The just penalty for sin having been paid in full, he said as he hung from that cross, to telestai. Right? It is finished, John 19. That, that Finished. That means there's nothing left to do. Okay? Man, man, death and sin are over forever. The fearlessness and greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because the penalty for all of your sin, past, present, future, wiped out, paid for, gone. Thirdly, kind of wrapping up the first half of our verse here. This is great. Isaiah tells us the government shall be upon his shoulder. That's interesting to me that it's singular. The Lord doesn't need both to carry anything. This verse could very well say the government shall be hoisted by his pinky to make the point, all right? But now, so, so where the phrase a son is given took us to eternity past, this prophetic statement takes us all the way out to eternity future. Right? And so the Bible is telling us Christ will rule and reign. It tells us this, does it not? That Christ will rule and reign over a literal, earthly, geopolitical kingdom that encompasses all of the kingdoms and governments of the world. Zechariah 14, Daniel 2. There is a day coming in the establishment of the, his eternal kingdom where the government of the world will rest upon his shoulder while he will reign as sovereign over a planet-wide kingdom of righteousness and peace. What, what was the last verse in our text in Luke, right? Glory to God in the highest and peace. That's coming. In the meantime... That government operates in secret, doesn't it? Through those in whom his sovereign rule is made manifest, right? To those who trust the Lord. The fearlessness and greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because you are already part of an eternal kingdom that will never end. Rejoice. Now, an interesting thing has happened if you've been paying attention. Yes, we have the humanity and divinity and authority of Christ represented respectively, but the prophet has chose to unfold these attributes under the inspiration of the Spirit over the span of all eternity, hasn't he? Did you catch that? Uh, Notice here, let me help you. Unto us a child is born, that's the Christmas present, that night in Bethlehem in the Gospels, right? But to us a son is given, takes us all the way back to eternity past, and now the government shall be on his shoulder. That takes us clear into eternity future. And so from front to back, if you will, like what do we have lying there in that manger on that Christmas night but the Alpha and the Omega, right? The first and the last, the beginning and the end so beautifully couched in, in these tenses, the, the fearlessness and the greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because he is behind you and before you, in front of you. He is the beginning and the end. He is the author and finish it, finisher of your faith. He who began a good work in you will be faithful. I am certain, Paul says in Philippians 1, to complete it. He will never leave you Or forsake you. Rejoice. All right. So having told us who he is, Isaiah now moves to inform us concerning what he will do or or what is available to you and I through these four names or, or 
for offices that this child will fulfill. So let's move into 4, 5, 6, and 7 here in Isaiah 9, 6. Number 4 now. Gosh, I love this one. One of his names shall be Wonderful Counselor. What is this that we're reading out of exegeting every Sunday? What, what is this? His counsel to you and I in the word, right? Is this not his counsel? Wonderful Counsel, I, this is why I'm fond of this. Uh, Jesus told us in, in John 14, 6, he is the way and the truth and the life. He is the source of all truth. He, he is quite literally truth incarnate, and his word is that truth written, like John 1, right? In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and was God, became flesh, tabernacled. He's called the word, the truth spoken, right? Right? fascinating stuff. His word is truth written, codified, the absolute standard for you and I, the plumb line that we might never be confused. All right. High priestly prayer, John 17, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. And so listen, you do not ever have to be afraid You don't ever have to be confused or uncertain because you have a wonderful counselor. And let me tell you something about the counsel of his word by way of reminder. It really is, as Isaiah says here, wonderful. What do you mean, Pastor? His counsel, his word to you and I, you know this. It's not given that we might straighten up and fly right and try to relate to God or, or find some kind of a standing before God on the basis of our own performance. No, no. He has already performed all that ever needed to be performed salvifically on that cross for our salvation. You are right with God. I am right with God because of what he has already done, not by what we do. We know that. Again, friends, it is finished. It means there's nothing left to do. It, is that Wonderful? Yes. But the question I want you to ask here, you being a saved believer, the question I want you to ask is, why is his counsel wonderful? Because having saved you, he's not finished, right? Having saved you, he's just begun. Begun to what? Bring you into the fullness of joy available to you right here, right now, this side of the resurrection, okay? I think that's wonderful. Now, you know this text. If you go to this church, I know you do. What did Jesus say to us in John 15 concerning specifically his commands for us in Scripture? He said this. This is Christ speaking. These things, my commands, specifically referenced in verses 9 and 10, these commands I have spoken to you so, there it is, Okay, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. You you, you know, that's why we're here, right? Running his program for your life, already saved believer. It's not there so you can somehow maintain your standing with God. No, being already made right with God by his work alone. The counsel of your savior is wonderful because it is there for your human flourishing. The fearlessness and the greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because he has given you all that you need in his word for the fullness of joy. He is wonderful counselor. Fifthly, he is mighty God. This is an affirmation of his deity from number two, but but in a more explicit fashion. I mean... Now we're just coming right out and saying it, right? This kid is God. By the way, is this not about as obvious a proof text as you're going to find concerning the deity of Jesus in the Bible? People will say to me from time to time, where does the Bible come right out and say that Jesus is God? Well, do you have a couple of days? Because, man, I, I can show you. Tough to beat this one, though. This child is mighty God. 
Now, what does the Bible say of God? That he is omnipotent, preeminent, powerful, strong, mighty God. That, that's the idea. Here's, here's what I think some of us miss about Jesus. That we definitely want to recapture today, okay? We tend to think, do we not, that it was the Father who flung the stars into space, who hung the earth on nothingness, Job 26. We tend to see the Father behind the sensational sunsets and the majesty of mountain ranges. It must be the Father behind the galactic vastness of the cosmos. Do we understand that the Bible explicitly declares Jesus, the agent of creation? Speaking of Jesus very explicitly, the Apostle Paul tells us this in Colossians chapter 1. For by him, Jesus, by him, all things were created. Let's make sure, Paul, right? Both in heavens and on the earth, both visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority. Look, look, all things have been created by him, through him, for him. By him, through him, for him. All things were created. (laughs) Do we really understand who put himself in that manger? Who condescended, so condescended to become one of us? Well, the very agent of creation himself, Jesus Christ. Exalt him in your hearts this Christmas. He's so much more than you may imagine. The fearlessness and greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because there is no limit to the power of the one who is heaven-bent on pursuing the fullness of joy for you now and forever in glory. The next one tends to throw people. It's why I like it. How can Jesus, the Son of God, be called eternal Father here? Son? Father? And it's an excellent question which requires a bit of complexity. However, let me try and make it simple for you today. I say that sort of tongue-in-cheek, but let me try and and make this simple. Much of the answer to this is found in our previous explanation for mighty God. This Hebrew phrase for eternal father here is aviad, all right? It is a single phrase. It is a Hebrew phrase that is used in the Old Testament predominantly in connection with creation, all right, with God creating. Aviad means father, literally father of eternity. And so I don't see this as, as really touching the father's person in the triune godhead, uh, though the English can cause us to stumble there. Uh, But I think we're simply seeing the fulfillment of this Hebrew phrase in the Colossians 1 text we just read, right? By him, for him, through him, all things were created, including the fabric of space and time. I mean, you you can look at John chapter 1. The beginning was the word, right? You can look at John 1. You can look at Hebrews 1. You you can look at Colossians chapter 1. All the same thing, right? What becomes abundantly clear to the Bible student is it is the Father's own testimony that Jesus the Son was the person of the Godhead who created time out of eternity and fashioned the universe from nothing. By the way, that's Hebrews 1, uh, 10 to 12, okay? And so therefore, Jesus has fathered time, if you will. He has begot time. I I always used to explain it like this. We are in this sub-reality in time and space, okay? So so here here we are in this lesser sub-reality. God is outside of time. God is beyond time. And what Christ has done here is he has created this lesser sub-reality in time and space, out of which to redeem you and I upwards and into his forever greater eternal reality. Well, now we're getting all metaphysical here 
Pastor, we're getting ontological, and that, that's kind of the point, okay? Listen to me. We can't even begin to touch the multidimensional creative genius of Jesus Christ, the agent of creation. Exalt him. And so what I think this can mean to us this Christmas is this. Pray tell, brothers and sisters, is there anything too hard for the Lord? No. Because he is a quantum God. All right, let me tell you what I mean by that. Even if you've lost loved ones in the Lord, all right, do you know that the Father of eternity is preparing for you now even a stunning reunion made far better by this temporal absence? We just don't get it. The fearlessness and greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because nothing is too difficult for the one who is heaven bent on your eternal welfare. All of time, the entire construct of, of time and space is swallowed up in his glory. And it's all for you. We'll, we'll get to that later. For you. Finally, tonight, where all of this rolls up into, he is the prince of peace. And, and this is, again, what all of the other attributes flow into and resolve into. The, the culmination of his mission here on earth. Peace with God. Peace with God. Okay? And then, of course, what is produced uh, in the hearts of those who have made peace with God is, of course, the peace of God. And th those are progressive and distinct. What are you talking about? I'll tell you. What the person and work of Jesus Christ is ultimately to produce in man is peace with God, right? By our sin nature, we are all separated from God. We, we are, the Bible says, at war with God in our hearts. The, the Bible says we are in the natural at enmity with God. We, we are hostile to God, right? Romans, uh, James 4, Romans 8. But then when Christ went to the cross, he settled the score of our sin and our debt and our guilt. The, the just wrath of a holy God had been satisfied or propitiated, as we like to say. And now because of Christ, because of Christ, we can be at peace with God. There's no sin, debt, guilt between us anymore. We're, we're not warring with God when we surrender to the Savior. We have peace with God. And again, what that is going to produce an ever-increasing measure as we walk with and know better Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, through his written word, as we increase in our knowledge of his infinite excellence and value and beauty and worth, we are going to have the peace of God settle upon our anxious hearts in ever-increasing measure. Okay? The fearlessness and the greatness of your joy this Christmas is possible because Jesus took our sin that we might have peace with God so that the peace of God would settle and rule and reign in our hearts. And so that, that really closes the loop and breaks us right back through that portal to Luke chapter 2, where we ended up in verse 14, right? Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Indeed. And so what is my prayer that we have been reminded this morning that there is you believe this or you don't. And so it is my prayer that we've been reminded that there is nothing at all for the Christian to fear. And, and without fear, right? Without fear, there's only joy.
And what is there to be afraid of when you know the person who is behind you and before you and for your joy in all things? Right? We're serving one another by way of reminder, right? Whatever is allowed to come into our lives is allowed to do so only that he might separate us from the inferior things, the inferior affections, in order to bring you to the fullest expression of joy available eternally to you. Romans 8, 28, we know that, right? If indeed all things are being worked together for your eternal good, what, pray tell, is there possibly for us to be afraid of? And where there is no fear... All that's left is joy. You go home and spend the rest of this Christmas day, have your meal, exchange your gifts. Those are wonderful things. Maybe you've already done that, but man, don't terminate your joy in that because there's so much more. Like You want to pop the lid off of your joy this Christmas? Man, take all of those wonderful moments and use them to worship your God. He gave them to you for your delight. Rip the ceiling off of your joy this Christmas and give him honor and praise and glory for all of the good things that have come to you. They're there because you are his his kid and he delights in you. Fear not, my friends, because born unto us that Christmas night in the city of David was the Savior who is Christ the Lord. Supreme in authority, curios, God, Master, Lord. And man, go home with this. He is for you. Right? Like, do we believe that? Romans 8.31. He is for you. That benevolence, that brilliance, that genius, that eternality, all of his power and might and wonderful counsel, it's all for you. It is for you. Do you believe that this Christmas? And if he is for you, the Pauline text goes on to say, who can be against you? Right? The fearlessness and the greatness of your joy is available to you this Christmas, not because he is 10% for you, not because he is 50% for you. No, no. Not because he is 80% for you. Fearlessness and great joy can be yours because he is 100% for you. For unto us, us, all right, unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of time and space, the Prince of Peace. Rejoice. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Well, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to just center ourselves and the brilliance, and the beauty, and the benevolence, and the holiness of Jesus Christ, who is your image flashing forth for us to see and be lit up by and warmed by. Father, I pray you would help us to move past the the kind and good and many things you have allowed us to have today and just worship you. May this Christmas be a Sabbath, a rest unto you, that we would just rest in your provision and your care and your love for us. May it be so this day. May we honor you. Lord, would you accept our imperfect worship as a pleasing fragrance to you? We ask these things in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, Amen. Merry Christmas, brothers and sisters.